The following broadcast will contain discussions of legal matters, but is not meant as legal advice. Jordan is not a lawyer. The following arguments and conclusions are based on the information collected, which will be listed in the video description. If you have any questions about copyright law, please consult an actual lawyer. I didn't think I would ever be talking about Archie Sonic like this. When I first uploaded my video, Does Ken Penders Really Own Evil Sonic Slash Scourge? It was meant as a one-and-done video talking about a court case I had been enthralled with. I was a huge fan of Archie Sonic, but being discontinued since 2017, I thought nobody would care about it. It's about a long-dead version of Sonic that wasn't even liked by the wider community. But when it was released, I was ecstatic to be proven wrong. Folks liked that video and wanted to see more, thus starting the long and winding journey we've taken with Archie Sonic. But the thought of returning back to the topic that kickstarted my channel wasn't in the cards. I didn't want to be known as the dude who had an unhealthy obsession with Ken Penders. Despite my initial hopes of not discussing them further, it was inevitable I would mention or talk about them. He was one of the main writers of Archie Sonic, after all. But I didn't want to return to the topic of that court case, but several events would change my mind. First and foremost was when a Twitter user named Off... Is it Off? Off? Is it Off? Off? Whatever. Shared court documents calling into question the information I shared in my last video. The absolute torrent of angry responses that it created was enough for me to consider revisiting it. But the second and most important event was the best of Archie Sonic collection I acquired from my friend Landon on my Discord server, which contained information that finally made me ask the question, does Ken Penders own anything? addictive toy in history and it's definitely the hottest thing this Christmas Nintendo video games they first arrived from Japan uh, three years ago and now millions of American kids are hooked and mesmerized the 1980s were a fundamental decade for video games dominated by Nintendo with the Nintendo Entertainment System or NES Nintendo was responsible for bringing the industry back from the brink after the disastrous video game crash of 1983 but, as essentially the king of the industry, Nintendo could set whatever rules they wanted, such as exclusivity agreements with developers. Sega was one of a handful of companies attempting to challenge Nintendo's dominance, but their answer to the NES, the Master System, failed to make a dent. Among other issues, Sega was lacking something Nintendo had, a recognizable and beloved mascot like Mario that could sell consoles. In 1990, Sega was holding an internal contest to decide a new mascot for the company, and the result was Mr. Needlemouse, later Sonic the Hedgehog. At the same time, Sega had hired Tom Kalinske to become CEO of Sega of America, and to overthrow the rule of Nintendo once and for all. When Sonic the Hedgehog was released on June 23, 1991, it was bundled with the Sega Genesis, a move initially rejected by the Japanese board of Sega, 
but overruled by the CEO of Sega of Japan, Hayao Nakayama. Thanks to a combination of this and excellent marketing, it'd be more like that nice boy Mario. Sega snatched the crown from Nintendo with a whopping 65% of the 16-bit market. Now firmly on the throne, why not cement their newfound victory with a television show and comic book starring their new mascot? Marketing. Our story then shifts away from bustling cities in California and Japan in favor of a more calmer environment. New Jersey. <laughs> It's on a beach in New Jersey that Mike Gollinger, writer for Betty and Veronica, would receive a phone call from Daryl Edelman over at Archie Comics. It's July 23rd, 1992, one year and one month after the release of Sonic the Hedgehog, and Sega of America wanted to market the crap out of their new blue blur. Edelman explained Archie Comics had acquired the license to Sonic and they wanted them to write it because of their experiences at Marvel Comics. I have no idea why Archie Comics was chosen, but nonetheless, the ink was dried and Sonic the Hedgehog would debut as a limited series before moving on to an ongoing series that would last until 2017. Would you be surprised if I said that Ken Penders didn't join the comic until later? Ken Penders comes to mind, you already have a preconceived notion in your head about who they are and what they've done. But let's start at the beginning. Ken Penders was born on September 28, 1958, and prior to Sonic the Hedgehog had done work for Marvel, DC, and other companies, most famously with Star Trek. Bring back Deep Space Nine, you cowards. Through said connections at Marvel, it's really complicated, I'm glossing over a lot. Penders was brought on board for Sonic the Hedgehog, and according to him, accepted it due to their familiarity with the character thanks to their son Stefan Penders, who would later appear in Sonic Live. Make that what you will. And their overall love for Sonic. You know, I'll say a lot about Ken Penders in this video, but his desire to take on the role because his son loved it is super sweet. Penders would make his debut in Sonic the Hedgehog number 11, where he would introduce Evil Sonic. You all know how much I like Evil Sonic. The story was one of several ideas brainstormed as, at the time, Sega wasn't mandating much of anything according to Penders, instead relying on writers to come up with stories that it would either accept or reject. But he wasn't only a writer for this comic, he also contributed to the artwork of many stories. Penders' writing and artwork undeniably shaped the future of the comic moving it away from its more comedic roots in favor of a tone similar to Satyam, its main inspiration. Despite the success of Sonic the Hedgehog as a comic series, the blue blur and Sega would deal with declining fortunes as the series went on. The success of the Sega Genesis withered away due to a series of failed add-ons such as the Sega CD, coupled with a resurgent Nintendo and newcomer Sony with their PlayStation console. The Sega Saturn, the successor to the Genesis, would be a costly misfire for the company, and the lack of a mainline Sonic title, for various reasons that are way too long to discuss in this video, would hurt it and the brand as a whole. And to top it all off, Satyam, the show that served as a huge inspiration for the comic, would be cancelled before a third season could be made. It was therefore thought with almost certainty the cancellation of the comic was imminent. Thus, Archie Sonic was supposed to end with the 50th issue in the arc Endgame, co-written by Ken Penders. But strong sales would allow the comic to continue on. But with no new Sonic media besides Sonic Underground, making shit up is the only thing you could do. During this era of Archie Sonic, I affectionately call the was everyone on LSD era, introduced some of the wildest and most insane stuff you could only imagine in an officially licensed comic book. But Penders was more focused on Knuckles the Echidna, whose miniseries was so popular it ended up being its own series that lasted from 1996 until its cancellation in 2000. Other writers would focus on Sonic, such as Carl Ballers. Ken was therefore free to create and explore their own mythos with Knuckles, such as their romantic interest Julie Sue, who is somewhat related. Hit it! But as mentioned before, Penders claimed Sega was largely hands-off with the comic during this time. If that's true, 
This would be much to their detriment. Sonic titles would finally come in the late 1990s and early 2000s with Sonic Adventure and its sequel, Sonic Adventure 2. But it did nothing to help Sega. The Sega Dreamcast, the successor to the Sega Saturn, was another failure for the company for various reasons, and coupled with other financial issues was the straw that broke the camel's back or the blue blurs back in this case. In 2001, it was announced that Sega would move away from developing home consoles, and later would merge with pachinko manufacturer Sammy in 2004. And amidst all of this corporate chaos, Sonic the Hedgehog was seemingly unaffected and continued to run as usual. But what was usual wasn't working anymore. Listen, I know there's folks who bristle at the idea of mandates or guidelines for Sonic arguing it stifles creativity. I do agree with this to some extent, but they can often serve as guardrails to help avoid a licensed work from going completely off the rails. Unfortunately, in my opinion, that is exactly what happened in the 2000s, that either less or non-existent guidelines from Sega would lead to an overall lack of direction on what the comic should be. It made a ton of sense for the late 1990s when there wasn't a ton of Sonic media being made. But by the 2000s, there were mainline titles and spin-offs being made frequently. But Sonic comics of this era had little to do with any of that. It was therefore a hot mess, with writers such as Ken Penders creating some of the worst stories it could muster. Now, in fairness, Knuckles the Echidna, as mentioned before, was cancelled in 2000 with Penders working on Knuckles' side stories, later Mobius 25 years later, and then on top of the main book after the departure of Ballers. It wasn't only the writers. Sega was apparently non-existent providing materials for upcoming titles on the chance they did want to tie in such as Shadow the Hedgehog, which Bobby over on Thanks Ken Penders alleges was a huge factor to why Penders would later leave, but more on that in a second. It wasn't only a lack of direction or materials from Sega either. There were issues in the writer's room. Penders and fellow writer Carl Ballers had vastly different ideas on where they wanted to take the comic with a back and forth momentum of undoing one another's stories and concepts evident in this era. It also didn't help Penders did not read the stories of other writers. He did admit this. Top it all off with the comics seeming to focus less on action adventure in favor of soap opera drama that nobody cared, and you have a fine mess that if something didn't change soon, this comic would sink. But a change in direction would come with the departure of Ken Penders in 2006. It's been often claimed that this was the moment where Archie Comics fired Ken Penders. That is not true. A freelancer like Penders, who doesn't officially work for them, can't be fired. But coinciding with a shift at editorial in Archie Comics in January of 2006, editor Mike Pelletrio told Penders he would no longer be writing for Sonic the Hedgehog. Quote, Finally, this past October, editor Mike Pelletrio told me he wanted to make a change. The Mobius 25 years later two-parter I had recently turned in would be the last story I would write for Archie Sonic in the foreseeable future. He did, however, allow me the chance to continue working on the book in an artistic capacity. I accepted those assignments at first. Then, while working on an assignment, I discovered that there were more pressing family matters as well as other opportunities elsewhere that I couldn't afford to turn down any longer. Ken Pender's last writing credit would be Sonic the Hedgehog 159, with Sonic the Hedgehog 169 being their final contribution, working on the inks and lettering of that issue. Well, he would end on an incredibly low note, the overall legacy he left behind for the comic is undeniable in terms of the characters and stories he created. He should be looked back on as a writer and artist who contributed so much to this comic, sometimes for better, other times for worse. But his successor would have enormous shoes to fill. Could they even be filled at all? It turns out they could, but not in the way anyone expected. This new lead writer wasn't like Penders, who had written several comics before being offered Sonic. 
He had sent in unsolicited scripts to Archie Comics. Mike Pelletrio apparently liked the unsolicited scripts and offered them the chance to write backup stories for Sonic. But when Penders was booted out of the writer's chair, that writer would unexpectedly be handed control as a lead writer of the comic and given the impossible task of saving Sonic the Hedgehog from the brink. That writer was Ian Flynn. Cue the angelic choir, please. Yeah, there you go. Born on May 31st, 1982 in Charlotte, North Carolina, Flynn would make his debut in Sonic the Hedgehog 160, and along with newcomer artist Tracy Yardley, would revive this comic. Uh, no, actually, that's not accurate. What would be more accurate is stopping the ship from sinking, making it somehow shinier than it once was, and adding rocket engines to the back of it as it sails off into the sunset. To be fair, this did not happen overnight. A large chunk of the next couple of years would be spent wrapping up loose ends and laying the groundwork for future stories. Eventually, the comic returned to its roots as an action-adventure comic first, other stuff second, missing since the late 1990s. It was overall fantastic, and even if you don't really like Ian's work, critics can acknowledge that it's better than what Penders was writing, especially in the later stages of their career. I wish I could say that's where the story ended. Penders would have moved on to better things, and we wouldn't have heard from them much as they explored new opportunities and found success elsewhere. Saw the Hedgehog would continue to be successful under Ian Flynn, and all would be right with the world. Alas, we all know how this story ends up. It's an inevitable conclusion. Penders did have other opportunities after Archie Sonic, but they seem to have dried up after 2008. His post-Archie Sonic work includes storyboarding episodes of television shows such as Alien Racers and King of the Hill, as well as maybe working on the advertising concepts for the Motorola Razor, although I can't find a source with that one. He would also attempt to develop his own television show, The Republic, in a live-action adaptation of his short-lived Lost Ones comic. But only The Republic managed to have this pitch video thing, I guess, made, and man, is it just awful. You sure you have the right house? We didn't call for service. That's no need. It's a free upgrade. Free upgrade to what? It's got something to do with the uh, Freedom of Information Act. It's going in everywhere. Huh. It seemed that he could not truly escape the blue blur for long, as in 2010 he would make his disapproval for the direction in his absence known. It is very long, so I have to shorten things for the sake of time and only share the highlights. Penders accused Ian Flynn and editor Mike Pelletrio of not knowing, quote, what to do with either the characters or the stories beyond regurgitating what came before. He also wondered if Ian Flynn, quote, ever attempted going beyond what any of us did, if he's created a character like a Julie Sue or a Jeffrey St. John, or if he's written something like an Endgame or the Dark Legion that people are still talking about years later. Penders further accused Ian of his stories being based on an outline he submitted to Pelletrio for Sonic the Hedgehog 160 to 175 such as the issue where Antoine and Bunny are married. He concluded by saying he had, quote, nothing to be resentful over and much to be grateful for, but concluded what, quote, Mike and Ian are doing is living off the work done by others that came before them, instead of allowing Sonic to grow and evolve in a similar organic manner when I was on the book. He also said that the stories were in his eyes, not canon, and that, quote, Anything he writes can easily be counterwritten by a better story with an alternative solution. Yikes. There is a lot to unpack here. In fairness to Penders, I completely understand seeing something you created take a different direction than what you had envisioned and being upset by it. But it's not uncommon, in fact, it's expected, for successive writers to take what came before and add their own touch to it for better or for worse. That includes scrapped or unused stories by other writers. Which is funny because Penders may have done the same thing with Sonic the Hedgehog 150. Some of you might remember that I talked about Sonic the Hedgehog 150 on a previous episode of Jordan's Soapbox. And in that episode, I mentioned that, while I can't find definitive proof of this, Carl Ballers did have a list of ideas for Sonic and one of them was a story that was eerily similar to the one that Penders would eventually write. I could be wrong, but my point is, this happens all the time. 
it's moot anyway, because Ian did clarify in one rare response to Penders that he was, quote, mistaken in his assumption that we used material he had prepared before his departure from the book. All stories and the overall story direction was of my own creation. Specifically, the marriage of Antoine and Bunny was the logical progression of their relationship, and was meant as a strong positive high note to be juxtaposed with the tragedy of Sonic the Hedgehog 175. This criticism, however, would pale in comparison to what Penders would announce months later in June of 2010. He started claiming ownership of the stories, characters, and artwork during his time at RG Sonic. He had started registering this with the U.S. Copyright Office in January of 2009. Why? According to Penders, this was in response to the release of Sonic Chronicles The Dark Brotherhood, a 2008 DS title developed by Bioware that he alleges used his characters and stories without consent. Penders, in his view, was wanting to protect what he felt was his work and was also working on an independent continuation of Mobius 25 years later. But I think there's another reason why Penders did so, although this is speculation. It's clear he was unhappy with how his characters and storylines were being used by Flynn and Pelletrio. He even highlights how, quote, Every story since issue 160 that features my characters and concepts is essentially unauthorized, as I did not grant Archie Comics the right to use my creations for their benefit without compensation to me. That just so happens to be the issue where Ian Flynn started. And coupled with his statement months beforehand, I believe he felt entitled to the work he did on Archie Sonic and was unhappy with the direction it was going in. He started to claim ownership to prevent their further use and seek monetary compensation for it. Regardless, it would have serious consequences if Penders had their way, not only for Archie, but for fans and distributors of Sonic the Hedgehog. Penders stated those who wanted to use their work, quote, must first contact me for permission and to make arrangements for the use of this material. For instance, if someone simply wanted to use a panel or a page he owns, they have to ask for permission and place, quote, the proper copyright notice. For example, copyright 2010 by Ken Penders, alongside the graphic image. Those who were distributing and selling current issues of Sonic the Hedgehog, Sonic Universe, and collective works such as Sonic Archives Volume 3 featuring his work were, quote, asked to cease and desist or else risk facing the consequences. This includes any version of said material, which also includes my original works, which sees release in any format beyond the original published comic books including, but not limited to, digital downloads. The reaction to this announcement was, well, let's read some of the Sonic Retro form comments from the time the announcement was made. This has to be a joke. I can't believe that this dude would be so spiteful towards the publisher. I think that Archie will find a way around it, either through monetary compensation or outright challenging it in court. Panders is showing the maturity of a small, overprivileged child. Such unprofessionalism is disgusting. How is this even possible? There's no way he could actually own any of these characters when they're all essentially knuckles with optional gender swaps and accessories tacked on. Jeffrey is practically the only remotely original character he could lay claim to. He's going to crash and burn spectacularly. Fuck you, Ken! Uh, fuck you! That's all I've got to say about this! Although Archie Comics or Sega did not take legal action against Penders when he originally filed his copyright registrations, in the fall of 2010, Archie would sue Ken Penders over his claims. The lawsuit had officially begun, and it should have been so simple. So what the hell happened? So this is where things are a bit confusing, as there's actually two lawsuits. We're only focusing on the one between Ken Penders and Archie Sonic. The other one really does not matter. This is normally the section where I would do a detailed analysis on the lawsuit, discussing the arguments of both sides, etc. Unfortunately, these documents are only available on a site called PACER, also known as the Public Access to Court Electronic Records. They charge an obscene $30 per search, with a $0.10 cent per page fee up to 30 pages of any case document, docket sheet, or case-specific report. Oh, and audio files of a court hearing are $2.40. I could spend the next several paragraphs railing how a supposed website run by the U.S. government charges these fees for public access. I'm the government. I'm the government. 
I'm the reason nothing works. But we're moving on. We'll have to make do with what information we do have about the lawsuit. The U.S. Copyright Office does not verify the validity of copyright registrations. Any objections need to be settled in court. Pender's claiming in 2010 he had registration and therefore could take legal action against those who infringed on his work is incorrect. Those registrations are not absolute, and someone could and did challenge him. Looking at the copyright registrations he did make, which are 125 total according to TSSZ, only one is actually related to a character, related to artwork in Sonic Super Special 11 for Hershey the Cat. An argument is that by owning the artwork to a character, one would also own the character as well. But I would challenge it as a copyrighted work can have multiple authors to various elements. Zarya of the Dawn by Krish Kashanov is a recent, if flawed, example. The images were deemed ineligible for copyright as they were made by an artificial intelligence, but she was allowed protection for other elements of the work such as the writing. Likewise, Penders may have filed and received registrations for the text and artwork of various stories he did on Archie Sonic, but it does not automatically mean he owns the characters as well. He even did attempt to register some characters such as Kragok and the Dark Legion, but were denied and received the following note. Regarding authorship and new material included, characters as such not registratable. Registration based on deposited authorship describing, depicting, or embodying the characters. Authority Compendium 2, 202.02i. There's also the matter of whether Ken Penders signed a work for hire contract, which is an agreement that would have RG Sonic, his employer, as the owner of anything that Penders, a freelancer, created. There's a source of enormous debate, and it's incredibly important, as if Penders did sign a work for hire contract, it would effectively make his copyright claims null and void. In 1999, Pender stated the agreement between RG Comics and Sega stated, quote, any and all characters created in the Sonic and Knuckles comic books become property of Sega. Furthermore, he said he, quote, knew that going in and had no qualms at the time. Penders would later claim he was misinformed of their rights, and testimony from other writers such as Scott Shaw alleged they didn't sign work for hire contracts. It's the conclusion that's been repeated ad nauseum. Archie Comics was unable to produce a copy of the work for hire contract that Penders allegedly signed and thus lost the case. But there is evidence to suggest otherwise. In 2022, Twitter user Off shared from an unknown source, perhaps Pacer? Court documents suggesting Archie Comics not only had one, but two work-for-hire contracts. Now, I have no idea whether these documents were written by Archie Comics' legal team, that's the most likely, or whether it was by the court themselves. This, regardless, is in line with comments about the situation Ian Flynn made in July of 2010. Quote, everyone on staff, and I include us freelancers when I say this, has to sign that contract. So unless Mr. Penders' contract was wildly different, he signed away those characters before he even created them. With the evidence from the court documents in Ian Flynn, who I think as the current lead writer would know a thing or two about that, there's enough evidence for me to suggest that Penders did indeed sign a work for hire contract. If that is true, how could it have reached a settlement and not a victory for Archie Comics? The original Archie Comics legal counsel hired absolutely blew it. What should have been a slam dunk case establishing clearly it was Sega who owned the rights instead turned into a slow moving train wreck that lasted years. The original counsel was fired in the middle of August 2012, and there was this absolute banger of a conversation about that. So are you saying prior counsel blew it? Absolutely, your honor. Well, give it to the jury. That's the way we're going to deal with it. My god, this thing has been litigated up, down. Despite that commentary from Judge Richard M. Berman, the case never went in front of a jury. It was never decided whether Archie or Penders were the true owners of the disputed material, as a settlement was instead reached. A settlement in legal terms is the agreement that ends a dispute that results in the voluntary dismissal of any related litigation. Why a settlement? I have a theory. RG Comics is a smaller company compared to the likes of Marvel and DC. Marvel and DC share enormous financial backing from their respective companies, the Walt Disney Company and Warner Brothers, that can afford legal counsel when necessary. RG Comics lacks any of that. 
They are a much smaller private comic book company comparatively, and they likely lack the amount of money to sustain legal counsel for a large amount of time. When the original counsel was ineffective and Sega for some reason refused to be involved in the case, Archie was essentially forced to settle with Penders. Whatever the cause was, Archie and Penders agreed to a settlement. While the details of the settlement are not known, that's usual when it comes to legal settlements, there is some information that we do know. Archie did not acknowledge that Penders owned what he claimed, but wouldn't pursue further legal action if Penders used what he claimed. This essentially creates a frozen conflict situation, where both sides claim legal ownership but have agreed to disagree on the matter. That conclusion makes a lot of sense, as Penders would state in an interview with the Sonic Stadium that Archie could have, quote, the ability to go forward with these characters if they so chose, while also saying he has, quote, the right to move forward myself. It was also assured whatever Penders would make would not be too similar to the ongoing Sonic the Hedgehog series, which is likely why the continuation of that Mobius 25 years later storyline, The Lair Sue Chronicles, looks like this. Yikes. Based on the information that I have found and the arguments I've made, I conclude Penders doesn't own the rights to the characters he claims to own, but nobody will sue him over it should he use them. There's an interesting example of this in the Best of Archie Sonic, a collected volume of various issues from both the pre- and post-Super Genesis wave. More on that in a moment. Interestingly, one of them is Sonic the Hedgehog 232, which heavily features Jeffrey St. John, a character that Penders claims to own. There is no credit towards Penders in the copyright disclaimer in the book, and if Penders truly owned the character, there absolutely would be, or Archie Sonic would likely be sued again. To use an example, take a look at Transformers Classics Volume 1 from IDW. They are collected versions of the classic 1980s Transformers comic book from Marvel Comics, which so happened to own a certain webhead that appeared in issue number 3. IDW doesn't have the rights to use Spider-Man, Marvel owns that, and thus need to seek their permission to use the character. Sure enough, there's a copyright notice for Spider-Man belonging to Marvel Comics in the disclaimer of the book. Archie, therefore, could have theoretically continued to use those characters, but chose not to. It was decided the entire series would instead be rebooted after the Worlds Collide crossover with Capcom's Mega Man. This continuity was called the post-Super Genesis wave, and noticeably removed much of the material made by Penders and other writers. He did not request the removal of his characters, but considering the entire ordeal, I'm willing to bet Archie wanted to remove everything that wasn't absolutely stuff they could use to avoid issues in the future. Also, perhaps maybe to devalue these characters, although that's pure speculation. Also, also, the comic was in desperate need of a reboot anyway. The timing was simply there. Penders is nonetheless blamed for the comic's reboot and the removal of those elements folks loved. They feel deeply hurt and upset. While the truth is more complicated, as I mentioned, I also understand why someone feels like that. It doesn't help that Penders' Twitter, I refuse to call it X, account adds fuel to the fire with inflammatory tweets such as this, this, and this. When I first sat down to write this, I imagined writing a similar conclusion to what I made with Does Ken Penders Own Evil Sonic? One of attempting to not give unnecessary attention to Penders. I realized how wrong I was. You can't. Not when someone so critical to the comic claims to own a chunk which has consequences. A reason why the post-Super Genesis wave exists. It is a reason why any future re-release of Archie Sonic, at least the pre-Super Genesis wave material, is unlikely because of his claims. And so much misinformation about Archie Sonic exists because of this lawsuit. So I'm writing a different conclusion. One that makes much more sense with the information we have. Penders is in a figurative hell of his own making. True, 
he may be able to move forward legally with his unofficial continuation of Mobius 25 years later, but it has been in development for more than a decade. And if it ever does release, it is shaping to be one of the ugliest comic book disasters in history. His reputation was torpedoed by the lawsuit and its ensuing aftermath, erasing the respect and admiration he once had beforehand. It has continued to sink further due to increased evaluations of his work, including from yours truly, his behavior on Twitter, and subsequent actions such as making NFTs. Or trying to. Did that ever go anywhere? His very name is a meme, a source of anger and ridicule for all those who hear it both within the Sonic community and beyond. Meanwhile, other alumni of Sonic have seen success, such as Ian, who wrote for future Sonic comics as well as Sonic Frontiers now. This is why I would say for those wanting to argue, debate, or otherwise interact with Penders, don't. It isn't worth the energy. He's already suffering consequences from this. There's nothing further to do. It's cold comfort, however, to those who love those characters, settings, and stories that defined Archie Sonic for folks, including myself. Like I've said, I started with Sonic the Hedgehog 151, and that was written by Penders. I doubt that my words will make things better, but I can say that it doesn't matter what legal claims Penders makes. It matters what you think. What's stopping you from remembering these characters, loving them, and making cool fan stuff? I mean, the Sonic community is kind of known for that. Nothing. Nothing at all is stopping you from doing any of those things. It's difficult in a situation like this. None of what I've suggested will bring them back in official media, but it's the next best thing. Time may not heal wounds caused by this dumpster fire of a legal battle, but it allows us the chance to write a different, more positive ending for this entire mess. Time. Time. Wait. Time. That's what I've been missing, Belle. If I can alter the timeline, I can prevent Archie versus Ken Penders from ever happening. And how are you supposed to do that? Do you remember how we got here? No and I can't understand why. It's a side effect of the reality jumping, which is exactly what we did. Hopping from one reality to another with this. We arrived to this reality in the hope to make our own a better one, but none of us realized it could be used for a different purpose entirely. Oh, I see where this is going, to alter time. Exactly. With a few adjustments, I can make this thing into a full-blown time machine. But how can you prevent Archie versus Ken Penders from ever happening? It's honestly really simple. I need to set the date for 2001, visit Archie Comics headquarters in New York, let them know what's on the horizon, thus avoiding that future. But weren't the contracts and money main issues? True, which is exactly why I happen to have copies of said contracts and a buttload of money I may or may not have stole. It sounds like a good plan, but we have no idea how this is going to affect the fabric of reality itself. We've always been pulling things from other realities, but never making an attempt to alter this one. I know, but this is our one shot to make things right and to make a better future. Zwolf, how are we looking? Ready! Come back in one piece after all this. I will. Scratch that. He better come back in one piece after all this. Look, Mommy! A talking animal! Dear, that's one of those furries. Best to move along. Okay, that is probably the second weirdest interaction I've ever had. Okay, 325 Fayette Avenue, Mamaroneck, New York. That address should be here. Can I help you? Hi, my name is Jordan, also known as CJ. I'm a bear, don't ask questions, I'm from the future. Yeah, from the future. Listen, we have a lot of mentally ill folks in New York, so you wouldn't be the first- I really don't have any time for this. Here, see this thing? That doesn't look like any PDA I've seen. It's a smartphone. It's like a computer and a phone mashed into one device. It has everything that you need to know about what I'm talking about here. Mr. Penders is gonna do that? Yes. But I do have a way you can avoid that. This suitcase has everything you're going to need to avoid it. 
Store it in a closet and don't open it until 2010. All right. I think that's something we can do. But my boss isn't going to believe me when I saw I received this from some costumed creature from the future. Just tell them it was something you found in the archives and it should be stored away. You never saw me. Understood. Wait, where did he go? I need to lay off the coffee. Ah, <sighs> that was a successful mission. Wait a minute. Things look... different. Like, really different. Destroyed different. Bell? Zwolf? Anybody? God have mercy on me. What have I done? And I don't remember much after that. Does she remember anything at all? Not much. When we found her, she kept repeating, Hedgehog, Priority One. She's speaking more coherently now, but we still aren't able to get much information. Alright, let me see if I can try talking to them. You're dismissed, Inquisitor. Hail Jordania. Ugh, I hate when they do that. Seriously, Empire is weird. You seem nicer than the other man who was interviewing me. I try to be. Hi, I'm Jordan. Let's start from the beginning. 